Welcome to Speechless. Glad to have you here today on this fine Thursday. We're live at the award-winning studios of SCC in White Bear Lake. And, you know, our judiciary, it just keeps coming and coming. And they do some crazy things. But a couple of subjects we're going to talk about is Judge Solvis out of Dakota County and how they dealt with his drunk driving and how he decided to uh, uh, declare himself disabled and the governor accepted that. We'll talk about that whole issue. Uh, it's a big expense for uh, the people. And also a disciplinary order came out on Jill Clark. We've been talking about that issue and the travesty that's been going on in relationship to her and her being targeted uh, because she is outspoken and a critic of our judiciary, which is a violation of the rules, uh, the canons, the ethics for an attorney to say disparaging comments about the judiciary. Uh, no free speech in our um, ex uh, judicial branch of government. Uh, it's just amazing. So we're going to discuss that case. Um, and then a little Maplewood issues on the elections coming up, some ca campaign financial reports here. So it's a, uh, a, a lot of stuff going on here. And I just want to thank uh, Bob Zick for filling in for me last week. Uh, I was out of town on vacation with my family. Uh, and we just had a great time. It was, it was a blessing, uh, to say the least. So Bob filled in for me, and you need to pay attention to the subject matter uh, that he talked about. He talked about the uh, Crystal Police Department and the corruption that's taken place there and how two very fine officers with no incidents and a good rack track record as police officers have been targeted by the captain there and uh, um, at least another police officer for speaking out about the corruption that was going on in uh, Crystal, the city of Crystal, Minnesota. And that, uh, you know, made it the big time press, but only on this show did you see the whole press conference. That's the only place you can see that. And I went out and filmed that and met these police officers, but there's other people that have been beaten up. And you saw the video of the guy just being hammered by a police officer after he had his hands in the air. We're gonna watch that again because you just need to see it. And you need to be proactive. And I actually believe my understanding, and I just, you know, honest folks, you gotta understand, nobody gets paid to do any of this. And so you're doing it in your spare time and uh, you're gone on vacation, busy schedule, um, and then you get back and you're working and you barely get here. So <laughs> you're trying to prepare things, but uh, the, I believe there's a rally six o'clock Monday, and I'm going to find out before the end of the show at the uh, Crystal City Hall uh, in, in support of these officers that are, that are good people and are doing the right thing and standing up against the uh, bad police that are out there. So um, we're going to talk about that, uh, show that video when, it, uh, when it's ready to be shown, uh, something that will get ready. So um, yeah, so thanks Bob for filling in and showing that, but we're going to keep that uh, corruption and crystal going on. Uh, it's gathering steam. You know, I don't care what city you live in, but if you're in one of these uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and then the suburbs, the, the city council of Crystal needs to feel the pressure because this is outrageous what they've done, not only these police officers, uh, but what one particular police officer has done to many citizens. And he, he needs to be held accountable. So, uh, Let's see. Oh, in the prior week, I hope you enjoyed uh, the questions. Of course, I was gone, but pre-taped a show about uh, 20 questions to ask your uh, candidate for the Maplewood City Council. And I hope it that gave you some good insight as to uh, uh, what's going on in Maplewood, but it's actually everything that's going on in your city, too. 
and you need to stay on top of all these issues because these issues are not about your liberties, they're about taking away your liberties and giving money to special people and actually establishing their own religion. And that's the way the Maplewood City Council is right now. They've established their own religion or are trying to. Fortunately, there's some people that are trying to take that and stop the growth of the Maplewood religion. Uh, and, you know, it's can't do it when you're outvoted. Uh, so, which also elections are coming up here, I believe. Uh, the primary elections is uh, August 8th, if that's a Tuesday. And I don't think it's a Tuesday. No, August uh, 6th is the elections. If I remember, oh, somebody will call in and tell me when. August 8th is a Thursday, so right. probably that Tuesday. Probably that Tuesday. But, I mean, early primaries in the middle of summer uh, doesn't, doesn't make a whole lot of sense, this new system we're under. So, well, let's, uh, let's uh, get to the issue of, oh, one other thing that we may get to. Uh, there's a great article uh, that came out in uh, American Justice. Um, it's called Justice Hacked. Your right to vote is at, sta at, is at stake. And basically, this article uh, written by, uh, it's not on the front, um, Colleen Perro, an attorney and public affairs accountant, a consultant in Michigan. Uh, and she writes this article for this uh, magazine here um, that's just uh, American Justice Partnership, which is basically describing what's going on in Minnesota right now where there's these elite people trying to take away your right to vote. And this article just does a fantastic job of describing who the people are, who the players are, and how they're being funded. And it's basically being funded by George Soros. Uh, he spent $45 million, and he's funneling it through uh, a number of organizations, and one of them is the uh, Open Society Institute, and that is part of the Soros Foundation. And, the, and he's got a network of foundations, but he takes that Open Society Institute money and, and gives money to other foundations who have said they will spend money spend money in campaign donations to go and um, make sure that your right to vote for judge is taken away. So then we just have an elite, small elite system from somewhere to eight to 32 people who will select the judges, you know, and it ranges from state to state, but whatever the state decides, eight to 24 to 32, people who will make the decision on who the judges will be. Of course, all those people are appointed by the governor. So instead of, as it is right now, where there's um, maybe 125 races across the state in Minnesota to, f to fund and to have ju judicial candidates, uh, you really only have to fund one race, and that's, that's the governor's race because he'll select all the people on this elite commission who is mostly going to be lawyers and uh, party hacks and, and people who the governor owes, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, paybacks. Um, they owe, the governor owes them this money, could be quid pro quo, whatever. And uh, but what is interesting is this Open Society Institute funds all these other uh, organizations and foundations on the basis that those foundations spend that money on the judicial going for taking away your right to vote and just have judges appointed and then have these retention elections where you would just be a yes or no vote whether you wanted the judge to say in office and you'd have these same 32 people decide 
whether the judge is qualified or not, and then you just make your decision based on whether the judge is qualified. So some of these uh, places that George Soros has given money to is American Constitution Society for Law and Policy, uh, Georgetown University Office of Sponsored Programs, um, Justice at Stake, Leadership Conference on Civil Rights Education Fund, uh, National Partnership for uh, Women and Families, League of Women Voters Education Fund, National Women's Law Center, uh, National Congress of American Indians Fund, Planned Parenthood Federation of America, the Reform Institute. They don't list anything here in Minnesota that I can see, the Public Justice Foundation of Texas, Center for Public Democracy. So there's just a lot of uh, places that this money goes and it goes into this justice at state campaign. So the money goes to these, the Open Society Institute goes into all these organizations. All those organizations then give money to justice at state campaign and, and it just gets funneled through. Now there's a group in Minnesota that have been funded uh, at least $200,000. And of course the former Governor Cui um, and uh, former other so-called elite um, have been getting money and a number of corporations have given money to take away your right to vote. This is a very elitist. This is an establishment of an oligarchy. You will have no say in the judiciary. You'll have no knowledge of these judges. It'll be a lot harder to hold them accountable and they are working hard. But this article, again, uh, you can Google Justice Hi Hijacked Justice hijacked, and then, uh, or the name uh, Colleen Perro, P E R O, and read the article. It's a great summary of what's taking place and what's happening in Minnesota. Uh, you know, and it's just amazing. And I can hear the people chanting that are in favor of taking away your right to vote saying, and it's a constitutional amendment, let us vote so we can't vote. I mean, this is just total nonsense. <laughs> total nonsense what's taking place and you should be very afraid and you may say I know nothing about the judiciary and you know there's a reason you know nothing is because they don't want you to know anything about the judiciary they want to be ignored and uh, when people start saying bad things about the judiciary that judiciary starts coming after them pretty hard and as hard as they can uh, and the only way they can't do it uh, is if a, somebody has too much attention or too much press attention. But you got to understand the press is afraid of the judiciary because the press gets sued and the press um, uh, uh, has their ties and they have things that they want to have happen. So there's a lot of uh, politics that takes place. Uh, and of course, as I would describe it, people defining their relationships with each other. And the Constitution, constitutional checks and balances really aren't there. And certain branches of the government are, are being held in secret as to what's taking place. But once in a while, a judge does something that is so flagrant, so um, bad, and it gets reported and things snowball, that action has to be taken. And of course, uh, Judge Michael Sovis, who last December, um, while he was drunk driving, uh, ran into five parked cars and then ended up in a snowbank. His wife gets out of the car saying, we did nothing wrong. Of course, these are all re what's reported. We did nothing wrong. We did nothing wrong. Well, uh, he ends up um, taking about six months uh, before he has his day in court where he then pleads guilty to a, uh, I don't know if it was a misdemeanor or gross misdemeanor. Either way, it was a misdemeanor, therefore a crime. And by that standard, Judge Michael Sovis can be impeached because our state constitution says uh, you can impeach a judge for crimes and misdemeanor. Now, the U.S. Constitution says high crimes and misdemeanors. 
but not the state. Now, what does the word high crime mean? High crimes mean the office. The office holder is in a high position. The, the crime or misdemeanor is just a crime or misdemeanor. It doesn't matter what it is uh, and what level it is, just as long as it's uh, a criminal action. And so a felony, misdemeanor, whatever. So uh, under that standard, Michael Sovis can be impeached because he pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor or gross misdemeanor. And that whole situation came down because he got a special judge for his case, a retired uh, star judge, as they, I think they call him, or them. Uh, and they, you know, do their own thing. And, and it was just a totally separate courtroom. No other cases were being held. And uh, it took six months to do this. Yeah, things can take time. But his first appearance took a long time. And it was just amazing. And so they were out there working on deals, you know, before he would come and make his plea. Well, that happens. You know, people are working on deals. But it ended up, his deal ended up being, and Governor Dayton signed off on it, that he would uh, take a year's disability. So he's getting paid, and their disability is 66% of their income, so at 100 Twenty thousand, he's making around seventy, seventy-five thousand dollars plus the benefits. Um, not a bad gig. And then at the end of that disability, he's going to retire, and then of course get his pensions. Um, but what should happen? Of course, this medical disability, uh, according to things I've been reading, uh, he spent thirty-three days in a treatment facility. And so his disability, who knows what it is yet, but definitely I'm sure it's uh, uh, alcohol related, may or may not be. Um, but they're calling that a disability. What is his disability? We should be able to find that out because he was a public official asking for public money. And then try, basically he's getting off scot-free, you know, in this deal. Um, so, well, not scot-free, but what is his disability? Does he really qualify for a disability? And if he had this alcohol problem before, why weren't these other judges exposing it? Because they have an ethical duty to expose that type of behavior if he's having a drinking problem. But understand this, Michael Sovis also had uh, his hand slapped a couple of times for fixing tickets. And he had some other ethics violations. And I went down to the legislature and I drew up a, a bio on Judge Sovis and said, hey, here's what's going on. Do your research. Here's your research done for you. Find out what these things are. You have a responsibility to find out about this judge and hold him accountable. He probably needs to be impeached. Uh, for his behavior, but obviously if you're claiming you have a disability because of alcohol, then you're not taking responsibility for your behavior. He should just resign, not take this, if it's an alcohol disability, he should not take that um, and then just retire on what he's got. Uh, but you know, the legislature, they're, they're afraid. They're afraid to go after the judges because they just think that the judges will go after them. All right, do we have that video uh, ready at all yet or no? No, okay. All right, then we'll go on uh, to the next issue here. Well, let's keep it on the uh, judiciary in Minnesota again uh, because just once again, I, I am baffled at our Supreme Court and what they are trying to accomplish with the discipline of Jill Clark. And we've talked about this on the show quite a bit. You've seen video of her arguing her first discipline case that the Board of Professional Lawyers Responsibility brought before the Minnesota Supreme Court. Jill challenged that uh, Board of Professional Responsibility order, and they said, um, and, and Jill challenged that, saying, first of all, she had a hearing with a referee. 
that didn't take place because Jill was disabled and couldn't be there. She was in the hospital. And then what took place is that the, uh, because she wasn't there, that referee moved to suspend her license and Jill got a chance to go before the Minnesota Supreme Court to get her uh, to argue why her license shouldn't be removed. And the j referee, or was a judge at, in this case, a judge at, acting as a referee, went and said that, um, Jill, uh, you're unable to participate in your own defense, okay? And they were going to stop her license because she wasn't able to defend herself. Well, that went before the Minnesota Supreme Court, and there Jill Clark was, and we saw the video on our show, arguing eloquently in her defense as to why, uh, what has gone on in her situation with her medical condition. Um, and the medical condition became an issue because she was being charged on another disciplinary matter because she went after a district court judge for bad ethical behavior and she filed complaints in federal court because this district court judge, um, I believe was, was Lucy Whalen, was not releasing transcripts, was not releasing the audio tape of a uh, police uh, interrogation at, that took place where Jill felt the transcripts were falsified. And so because of the federal lawsuit that took place, Jill filed a complaint against the judge. The judge went and filed 22 charges against Jill Clark or thereabouts. And that ended up producing a lot of stress in Jill's life, but also she became sick uh, during that time. And so um, when they were trying to discipline her for her comments about the judge, oh, by the way, uh, the uh, she, Jill Clark was able to get the audio tapes. Uh, the transcript was falsified. Her client did not say what the police had said that she said, they, uh, he said, and the case was dropped. Hmm, you know, but in order to get these tapes, uh, one second. is ready, and also someone called and said that the primary for Maplewood is August 13th. August 13th, okay. All right, um, so you're sitting there and you have your, um, this judge coming after you who you've proven was hiding information, didn't want you to get the information. You're vigorously defending your client. You got to sue in federal court uh, in order to get this information. So the judge files ethical complaints against you. That's, a, that's hardball. That's really, really hardball uh, going on. Uh, but Jill Clark was proven right, right, so now we're going to punish you for that because you said some things about this judge that we didn't like. And so during this time, Jill does become sick. And during that first hearing before the Minnesota Supreme Court, you heard that Jill Clark was having seizures. And so that was something to do with her medical condition. There may have been other things going on. Um, with it, but the Supreme Court then ruled in that, uh, that hearing in October, uh, around October 26, that Jill Clark now can go back and it needs to go back before this same judge slash referee, and, but the referee needs to make some medical findings. Hmm, you think he should have done that the first time? This is part of the uh, game that goes on in the courts, you know, the, the referee, the judge does a, you know, just does what they want to do. You got to go to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court sends it back to the same judge, and then that judge or referee, you know, they, they still do what they want to do. So they had a hearing and a medical evidence was produced, and you find out that with this medical evidence that um, her psychologists and um, therapists say that Jill Clark can defend herself and 
uh, also that she can defend clients, but some accommodations need to be made for a disability. You know, just like we, we do in every other aspect of, of life, somebody with disabilities, we accommodate. We, we have uh, push buttons for the handicap so the doors open. We have car carved out street issues. Um, there's a lot of things we do uh, for the handicapped. And if you got a mental handicap at that point in time, she was trying to figure out how to deal with these seizures and, and uh, other issues that were because of the seizures, I'm, I'm guessing. And it just took time. But, you know, that's not good enough for the Supreme Court of Minnesota. And because she went to five therapists and uh, didn't go to the court-ordered therapist, you know, you have a right to your own therapist. You know, this is like Obamacare. This is how our Minnesota Supreme Court is operating. Well, you go to our therapist. Well, no, I'm going to go to my, I'm going to go to the therapist that I think is doing the job for me and getting it done. And it took her five uh, therapists to get to the right one to diagnose the medical condition that was taking place and get on the right medication. And, and she's on that and the therapists are saying, yeah. Um, even the court order therapist is saying, yeah, she can, she can even defend clients, but let's not make this all so stressful for her, you know, and make some allowances like you should do for somebody with a, with a disability. And, uh, but the Supreme Court uh, wasn't having it. Um, well, actually, the referee wasn't having it. Uh, the referee says, well, you know, you may be the experts, but I, I don't believe you. And the referee ordered that Jill, yeah, Jill can defend herself now. She's capable. Of course, everybody saw her defend herself on um, uh, October 26th, and you saw it on my show. And now we go and, um, but you know what? You're, you can't defend clients. Um, so that decision came out December 27th. And this is a real interesting pattern that we're seeing here. Jill Clark can't defend, the decision came out on December 27th by the referee, Jill Clark can't defend herself. And he said, as of December 7th, Jill Clark can't defend herself. Excuse me, can't defend clients as of December 7th. We're not, she can't do it. It's, it's too stressful, whatever. Didn't really say, but that's it. Her, her, you know, her license is going to be removed. But now Jill has an opportunity to go before the Supreme Court and argue her case again as to why the referee judge was wrong and um, why you need to consider the therapist having higher value, whatever, and Jill needed to order transcript. But she didn't order transcripts. I mean, there's a multi-phase thing going on here, okay? This just isn't one piece of the puzzle. Jill knows the games that the courts play and how they manipulate things and, and ignore the rules when it suits their, their behavior and the things that they want to accomplish. And Jill, prior to her June, uh, prior to her October hearing, said, uh, Supreme Court, you need to recuse yourself because there's bias going on here. And the bias is you've spoken publicly against judicial elections, and I was a proponent of judicial elections. And, and I ran for the Minnesota Supreme Court. And, and you, you have this bias against me because, because of your stated position. And you don't want me to tell what's going on in the courts. So you need to recuse yourself and do a whole nother different system. So Jill raised not only a recusal issue, having these judges step aside, but she also raised a jurisdictional issue. Now by law and by rule, those questions must be answered first. Do you have jurisdiction, Minnesota Supreme Court? And do, does, are you going to recuse yourself or not? Okay, that's real interesting. So that has to be decided first. But understand, the Minnesota Supreme Court, totally ignoring that. Not paying attention to that, not doing that. And on October 26th, 
you know, when Jill Clark and her attorney were before the Minnesota Supreme Court, they raised that issue. We're not waiving this issue. You need to answer that issue. And when that October 26th decision came down, no answer. They didn't touch it. Yet, here it is. Here it comes. In a footnote. There it is. Just in a footnote, on July 23, 2012, Clark filed a motion to disqualify all members of this court from this matter. On October 15th, she filed a request seeking a date for her recusal motion to be heard because they hadn't heard it and they weren't going to hear it. So she files a motion July, uh, she filed a motion already in July 23rd, so we're going to July uh, August, September, October, so two, two months, two and a half months later, um, she files a request seeking a date for her recusal motion to be heard. Members of this court are subject to the standards of the Code of Judicial Conduct governing recusal. See Minnesota Code of Judicial Conduct, Rule 2.11, State X Rail, Wild v. Otis, you know, a bunch of numbers. However, it has long been the practice of this court to honor decisions of its individual members as to whether to participate in the pending proceeding. In regarding modification of Canon 3A7 of the Minnesota Code of Judicial Conduct, according to Wild, each member of the court has applied the applicable standards for recusal and made an individual determination whether to participate in this case. In light of the court's practice, Clark's motions are denied. This is a footnote. Um, and the question is, honestly, every attorney knows this scam that's going on here. I mean, this sentence just blew me away. Each member of the court has applied the typical standard for recusal and made an individual determination to participate in this case. Well, Lori, Justice Lori Gilday recused herself because that's who Jill Clark run, ran against for Supreme Court. But we have no record of anywhere that I've been able to see where these judges said why or why not they're participating in this case. Nothing. Okay, and that's what happens. A judge will write out, I don't recuse myself, here's why I'm not. Or they say, I recuse myself, and here's why. None of that's here. There's no record. But we've applied the applicable standards, which means the standards don't apply to the Supreme Court. That's how I read this. And, and it's just appalling to me, and it's in a footnote. Where's the motion hearing? You didn't do a motion hearing. She, she made a motion on it. And you didn't have the hearing. It happens all the time in district court. Unbelievable. But the Supreme Court, they're exempt. No motion hearing for them. It's just outrageous. And it's, so they answer it, but it's in a footnote. But you know what? They didn't answer. They didn't answer the jurisdiction question. Uh, I don't. I didn't see it anywhere in here. Okay. So here's what's going on. <laughs> to finish this out, Jill Clark has to go back. The Supreme Court says go back to this referee judge and have your medical testimony. Here's all the medical testimony. The judge says, I don't believe the attorneys in this case, or the, the medical professionals, and I believe you're still disabled and you can't represent clients, even those your doctors and therapists say otherwise. Hmm. You know, so he, uh, he made his recommendation, so it goes back up to Clark, but uh, to the, uh, goes back up to the Supreme Court, but Jill Clark doesn't show up for her hearing. And you saw the hearing on this show, Jill Clark wasn't there. And I'm guessing the reason Jill Clark didn't show up is because the Minnesota Supreme Court was not doing its job and she was sending a message. 
you got other things to do first before you have this hearing. You got to answer your recusal. You got to answer your jurisdiction questions. I'm challenging you on these. I'm making constitutional challenges in this process, and I have a right to defend myself. And you ignoring the questions that I'm asking, uh, I'm going to make sure you understand and and full on understand that uh, you're not doing your job. And this is nothing about justice. This is about brute force and taking somebody out uh, as uh, politically politely as they can, you know, without attention, you know. Um, so, hey, here's a footnote. We'll put it in a footnote about the recusal. Um, and they don't state how they did it, how each member determined to participate in this case. They didn't say on what basis they made that decision. You know, so Jill Clark, there's nothing written down. So Jill Clark cannot go to the U.S. Supreme Court and say, hey, this judge violated my constitutional right. She has a right to do that, but there's no record. And this is what these judges do. They provide no record and no basis for what they're doing. And sometimes, and even in this case, they provide a record, but the information is incorrect. Now, stating that the Supreme Court was in a tough spot somewhat because of their rules, in that Jill Clark should have ordered, could have ordered a transcript, challenged the referee's finding, and gone and said, hey, look, here's what really took place. And the referee's, referee's findings were not based on the facts of the case. And then the court can say, okay, you know, based on the transcript, yes, the referee's findings were wrong, which they were. There's factual inaccuracies in this case uh, about the times and what took place and whether she was represented by an attorney or not. There, there's just a number of factual errors. But Jill Clark did not have the transcript, so therefore she could not argue that case. However, and so the Supreme Court had to go by the record that the judge established, judge slash referee established. And they had nothing, no transcripts to go and say otherwise, which I think I find fascinating. Here the court is coming after you, and the Professional Lawyers Responsibility Board is coming after you, and they're making you pay all these expenses and fees, and you got to go by the transcripts. And... It's, it's, you know, the, the court is taking away somebody's property and they're not providing the evidence for it. And they're not giving you the evidence to defend yourself. I, I, just, I, I just find this appalling that our Minnesota courts behave this way. Um, and they should have provided the transcripts because they're the one charging her. And they're the ones coming after her. So they should provide the, the hearing information from what took place in the hearing. And instead, she's got to pay for all that. But I think Jill ignored all that issue to get them focused on the recusal. I think there's a bigger strategy in that. Now, Jill Clark can still go to the federal courts and defend herself there in, for these issues. The final order that came out by the Minnesota Supreme Court basically said, Jill, your license is suspended. You can, you can no longer defend clients, and, but you can represent yourself. You can assist in your own defense. I should say not represent yourself, but you can assist in your defense on your medical issues. So you don't like our orders, you can assist in your defense once you prove that you're no longer disabled, but you know what? What does that mean? They didn't say what that meant that you're no longer disabled. So she's going to have her therapist. I don't know what she's going to do, but her therapist going to go in and give the same testimony, and the judge is going to ignore that again. You know, well, not enough time has passed to know whether she's really uh, can handle this workload or not. Really, the therapist said enough time has. The medical doctor said it had. So this judge knows better. Nobody gave testimony otherwise. 
So from from what I read, from what I understand here, so um, so the process now. She gets to assist in her defense on the medical issues while all the other disciplinary actions are stayed until the medical issues are, are dealt with. Once those medical disability issues are dealt with, then they will give her license back and then she can start defending clients and also start the discipline actions against her all over again. <laughs> uh, now... Here's the final coup de grace in all this, in, in my mind. I mean, there's so many of them, but Jill Clark, suspension was as of December 7th, saying she can't defend clients. On December, December 11th, four days later, she was before the Minnesota Supreme Court arguing a constitutional challenge on 50-year restraining orders relating to 50-year restraining orders and the unconstitutionality of these orders. Uh, due process rights, uh, double jeopardy, uh, ex post facto, uh, a lot of issues. And she did a great job before the courts on December 11th. They all know it. That case was heard December 11th. There has not been an order, unless it came out, no, it didn't, wouldn't have come out this week, Oh, it could have come out this week. No, they came out the 29th. Uh, that, there's still not been a decision in that case. Here we are in August. Uh, we're, we're looking at almost uh, eight months later, nine months later, and we haven't had an order, a decision come down on that decision. Here's what I think is going to happen on this 50-year restraining order. I think they're going to say, because the referee judge said, and we have to go with their decision, as is December 11th, Jill Clark was unable to defend herself. And why December 11th? Because that was the date Jill Clark was before that referee on that hearing. The order didn't come out to the 20th. So there was no order. So Jill's continuing her practice. So she has a court case on December 11th. But the, I think what the court's going to do is say something like, because Jill was unable to participate to defend clients and her license was taken away from her as of December 7th, this case has to be retried because that client wasn't represented in court. That's just sick. It, it, it's just sick. So this guy has to go out and spend all kinds of money and retry the case. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, why they can't make it. I mean, who's mentally disabled here? You know, the judges can't make a decision in nine months on this case. Of course, they have no timeline. They can never make a decision. You know, but there's a political game. Uh, and, you know, everything is political. But there's gamesmanship going on here right now. So this issue doesn't get addressed. And, you know, make your decisions, you guys. Come on, this, this is ridiculous. I don't know when the end of their season is for uh, deciding things. I need to find that out. But it's ridiculous that it's dragging on so long. That's Jill Clark, what's going on with her. But let's show this video of um, what's taking place in Crystal of uh, this police officer being uh, beating up this uh, man. So let's go see that. Now there's no video audio on this. There there is, but this particular one, where the officer was beating up uh, the man, uh, you know, these guys were fleeing from police. They got stopped. He steps out of the car, raises his hands. Of course, we're redoing it. Guns drawn. He's standing there. This is in slow motion a little bit now. He's reaching for his arm to. Oh, and then this other officer comes in, one, two, saw two punches there, um, just comes in welling on this guy, one, two, three, four, five, well, now we got a different angle, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, uh, you know, it just, he just keeps pounding. 
uh, all these other officers there. Uh, the guy had his hands raised. The other officer was there uh, going for his hand. The guy was complying. This officer from Crystal was just uh, pounding on this guy. And, uh, of course, this man was 19 years old, I believe, doesn't know his rights, doesn't know this is wrong. And all of a sudden, press came out about this police officer, how he was behaving badly in other situations. And he got a hold of some people and brought this attention. This happened in 2007. Uh, but this officer has also been, as you saw on the last show, uh, other discipline issues where uh, basically a house that was under his care that he went in without a search warrant and ar arrested people, had some people deported, should have been illegal aliens, but not everybody in that family was illegal, alien. Uh, they were U.S. citizens. Locked up the house, was under his care. While it was under this police officer's care, moving vans came up, took away the property, and nobody knows where it is. No record of it. Plus this police officer, th this just this gets me here. Files a report, I'm gonna find that report here, uh, stating what took place in this, in, this, in this beating. And there it is. Um, I did exit my car and observed that AL, the, the man who had his hands raised, was attempting to run. Didn't see that there, was attempting to run. Northbound, away from officers. <sighs> what a blatant lie. He wasn't attempting to run anywhere. He had his hands up. I came around the front portion of my squad car and attempted to tackle him so that he could not get away. Let's see, he, another officer had his gun drawn reaching for his hand, the guy was being compliant for all we can tell, and then this officer comes and just starts hammering on him. Uh, I was giving him numerous verbal commands to cooperate and get down on the ground so that he could be taken into custody. Those weren't verbal commands. <laughs> Those were pounding your face in commands. Okay, A AL was not cooperating. Of course, we couldn't see in that video where he's cooperating at all, uh, whether, whether he's cooperating or not. Um, but, I mean, how are you going to cooperate when somebody's pounding your face and your, your, your natural reaction is to um, cover your head and protect yourself, you know? And he may be giving verbal commands, get your hands behind your back, and in the meantime, he's just wailing away on his face. Uh, so, AL was not cooperating, and I attempted to grab his arm and saw that Detective Zaret also attempted to grab his left arm. During the struggle, during, during the struggle to take control for AL, I received minor injuries to my right kneecap and began struggling with AL to get him to the ground. It should be noted at this time I was struck, stuck between my car and the suspect vehicle in tight quarters in an attempt to get AL into custody. I was able to physically wrestle and fight AL to the ground and attempted to handcuff Lee. It should be noted that I gave AL numerous commands to cooperate and put his hands behind his back, but he was not responding. I don't know, he's probably knocked out. Um, I don't know there. But here's an interesting thing. When an officer does the report, they got to get all the information in. There was no mention in this report that he, he used violence to subdue the guy. Nothing. And you have to do it. All right. That's why my understanding... I mean, this did make the press. It, it didn't cover all the aspects of this officer that did the beating and his other activities, then which is all tied into these two other officers uh, getting a bigger suspension for coming out and speaking against the corruption in, in Crystal. They had a bigger suspension than this officer got. He got, a, I believe it was 40 hours, 
one week, no pay. That's what he got. This guy needs to be fired. He needs to be held accountable. The police chief of Crystal, who's covering up, needs to be fired. It's just bad news all the way around. So, Monday, 6 o'clock, Crystal City Hall. Um, Monday would be the 5th uh, of August. So, if you're watching the show later, don't show up. Okay. Um, just an update. I will be filling in for Bob Zick's show uh, next Wednesday. We're going to talk about a lot of Maplewood stuff, the elections. Uh, I got some campaign reports here. Uh, I got Nora Slawick's campaign report as of May 24th. Uh, it showed that she had $1,000 cash, uh, total cash on hand. The line's blank. I mean, she didn't fill it out very well. Spent, you know, of course, this is May, June, July, August. Next report's coming out tomorrow, so we can watch that. Uh, campaign filings, expenses, $45. Um, but when you look at the contributors list here, uh, it's her campaign people. It just says uh, here uh, $300, $300, $100, and $200. So you've got to report everything over $100. But doesn't give addresses and where they work. That's required. You can amend, but at this point in time, that is not on this list. And one is not due until August 2nd. We'll see if she actually does what she's supposed to do. Of course, she's a state rep, was a state rep, knew that that was supposed to happen and still didn't do that. A uh, very sloppy report, to say the least, um, but not surprised. Um, then Mary Lee Abrams. Of course, these are people I do not recommend you vote for. Um, because they're with the crowd that is trying to do everything to take away your rights in Maplewood and establish this Maplewood religion of um, <clears throat> civic governance as God type thing where you bow to us at all incidents. They don't incidents we don't believe in, they don't believe in freedom of association. They're forcing you to pay for the uh, memberships of other people at the Maplewood Community Center. Um, they've been falsifying their uh, appraisals for the roads uh, in Maplewood um, and the assessments uh, of, of, of the streets. So anyway, I look at uh, Mary Lee Abrams. Now, at least she has a report right. <laughs> you know, she lists out the name and addresses and uh, where the people work. And of course, right now she's being funded by union PAC funds. Uh, 600 of her $950 was union PAC funds. And one person who's a uh, big time DFL activist in the area. All right, we got a phone call here. Caller, you got a comment or question? It's a comment, Tim. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to know, you know, after seven terms, in the legislature for Norris Lawlick. Is there anything at all that you find stands out <laughs> that she actually had done only at uh, election time is the only time you ever heard from her or about her? Well, and I'd I, like to know if there's any answer to that question. Thanks, Tim. That's, well, I'd like to know if you got anything, too, on her. After but, seven terms, I can't tell you one thing about the woman that, uh, you know, anything at all that she'd ever done. Well, this is an area where you can really uh, run for election and hide. Um, well, she did a really good job of it. Yeah, and I can just relate my personal experiences where I went down on some issues against domestic violence against men, which is just as often and just as violent against men as it is women. And those are the scientific studies, over 200 that have come out. She could care less. I mean, that was her attitude. Um, well, that's what scares me about her running for mayor of Maplewood. She could care less about the people of Maplewood, especially when she's got Willie Rossback pushing to get her in there, plus the other two henchmen that she's uh, running with and then using 
Kathy Juneman for their uh, uh, sponsor them and to give them their advice that they need for the running of Maplewood. Yeah, well, I would agree. They're they're very, uh, in my opinion, disrespectful people. Um, they tend to be egotistical, and I, um, I they don't know how to have a conversation. You know, as far as you know, debating issues or finding out information, um, they 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 can't handle it well. And of course, when you don't have to care and you're not being looked at, um, why why would they? Well, Nora is just as arrogant as Will Rosbach, and I. Uh, that's the only thing I had to say is is. If somebody could ever come up with anything that she's ever done when she was in seven terms, just man, you just think of that seven terms and never done a darn thing. Talk to you later. Bye. All right. Well, you know, she did vote the party line, but I agree with you uh, in your statement there. That would be my opinion, too, uh, as far as uh, disrespectful and um, uh, not really accomplishing anything except being a vote for. Uh, in my opinion, things that destroy families and things that destroy the state, but that's that's her record. All right, uh, I don't know if we uh, we got to wrap it up here. So I'll be on Bob Zick's show next week. Hopefully next week on my show uh, at eight o'clock we'll have Common Core uh, people discussing what's going on in our education system, and then Wednesday night at eight thirty on Bob Zick's show Inside Insight I'll be on there talking. Uh, uh, Maplewood elections and other issues with Maplewood, like their property assessments, that they are just uh, they're just losing these court cases left and right, and they're not even defending themselves. All right, good night. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? God bless. Uh, oh, and good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week.